everybody and it was a very nice session with uh, Dr. Vikas Gupta, uh, having heard about supracondylar fracture, which is an enigmatic, enigmatic fracture in the pediatric case group. There is another enigmatic fracture, which is lateral condyle. Now, supracondyle uh, fracture is enigmatic because it is, it is known for malunion. Now, lateral condyle is a fracture which is known for non-union. So, uh, having said that, the, the oldest classification for lateral condylar fracture was given by Mills. It is an anatomical classification where uh, it is divided into two types. The type one fracture is where the fracture line it crosses, uh, it, it crosses medial to the, it crosses lateral to the trochlea. It can cross through the capital epiphysis, and on an X-ray, a type one fracture will just appear like a flake of bone laterally. This fracture is inherently stable. Uh, this is type uh, four fracture, uh, uh, Salter Harris, uh, and it is less common. However, Milch type 2 fracture is more common where the fracture line it crosses way medial to the capitulum and it, uh, because it involves part of trochlea, this fracture is inherently unstable. Now, uh, you can see that it is the same fracture where it was uh, appearing to be stable, but over here it has fallen off. So there is inherent instability in this type of fracture. However, it is very difficult uh, on an X-ray to classify into Milch type 1 or type 2. So that is why a number of other classifications were developed. Now the simplest classification uh, which, which was developed was uh, undisplaced fracture or min minimally displaced fracture that is type 1, right, which has an intact cartilaginous hinge medially. Type 2, there is a complete fracture, the cartilaginous hinge has also broken, it is moderately displaced. And type 3, which is completely displaced and not only displaced, it has fallen off, it has rotated. So you can see in this, uh, the same child, right? So this is, it begins as a type one fracture, but we cannot see the cartilage hinge. Actually it has broken. It can be misinterpreted as a type one milch. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, a, a minimally displaced fracture. That is, that is uh, minimally displaced. A type two fracture, which is moderately displaced. And once it has completely fallen off, it has beginning to rotate. This is type three fracture. Now, uh, basic, base, basing upon these uh, displacement types, Jacob's caps have developed into uh, a, in a classification for three types, right? Type one, which is less than two mm, type two, which is two mm or more, type three, which is two mm or more with disruption of the articular surface. So they not only described the displacement, but also predicted the treatment. Now, usually they predicted that type one will require only casting, type two may require casting plus closed pinning, and type three will definitely require open reduction and pinning. Similarly, Song also developed a classification. His classification was five pointed, and he has also predicted treatment on the basis of displacement. Now, once the uh, patient has uh, reported to us, uh, the most difficult thing is to determine the displacement or instability. Now, as in this X-ray, we can see that clinically there is a swelling over on the lateral side. There was tenderness on the lateral part, and we were expecting a a fracture of the uh, of the lateral condyle but you can see over here there is no fracture right it doesn't show any fracture on ap view it hardly shows any fracture on the lateral view but if you take an oblique view it clearly shows a fracture so that is the importance of taking an internal oblique view in a child where you are suspecting a lateral condyle fracture another important thing to determine the displacement or instability is a weekly radiograph suppose if the patient comes to you with seemingly type 1 moderate, uh, 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 a minimally displaced fracture, and you decide to treat this fracture with a cast conservatively, it is imperative uh, that you must take another view after a week. If it falls off, it has to be, it, it becomes unstable fracture, and then it has to be taken up for open reduction. Other less used features to determine uh, displacement or instability are an MRI or an arthrogram. Now, it was long recognized that this fracture is, uh, produces a lot of complications and that is why it was called fracture of necessity by speed long back, right? So uh, the complications which can be produced are non-union and proximal migration of the fragment, cubitus valgus and sometimes varus, osteonecrosis of capitulum and trochlear physal arrest, which may lead to fishtail deformity and definitely loss of elbow range of motion and cardiac and palsy. Because of uh, the list of these complications usually these fractures are treated surgically. So uh, what are the treatment uh, ideas we have? 
Now the treatment ideas we have is for a type one fracture, we can go for a conservative management, but as I told you that it requires a regular follow up. If you see that this fracture is falling off, it has to be immediately taken up either for closed reduction and pinning or for a formal open reduction and pinning. Now, just see, just look at this fracture, right? This is a seemingly type two fracture, right? It has been fixed adequately. The pins will be removed once the fracture line has disappeared and, uh, uh, and the fracture has nicely united. Now, the problem is not a fracture which, is, uh, which has come to us in acute states. The problem is presented by uh, uh, children which, who come to us in neglected or, la or late, late phase, right? That is in between two to 12 weeks. Now, in such children, usually we will see that the fracture is either tilted or it has rotated. If the fracture has tilted, it can be just fixed in C2 without doing much. We will just pass pins and a good bone graft is kept in between the metaphysis and the fallen off fragment. And it usually unites well. However, however, if the child does not come to us before 12 weeks, it is labeled as, it usually does not unite and it is usually labeled as non-union. Now, once the uh, child is labeled as non-union, it can present to us in three scenarios. Scenario number one, that is a painless but stable elbow. Scenario number two, again, the elbow is painless, but now the child has instability. That is whenever he lifts weight or whenever he is doing some certain, uh, uh, certain work, he has apprehension. However, still cubitus valgus has not developed. And the last scenario is that there is established non-union, but there is cubitus valgus has also developed. So number one, uh, there is established non-union, but it is painless and stable. There is no cubitus valgus usually. Uh, if, if it is just angulated, we will fix it in in C2, right? Adding a bone graft. If it has rotated, as in this, if it, if it gets rotated, usually the articular cartilage, it faces the, uh, the articular cartilage faces the fracture and the fracture faces outwards. So you have to, it's like this. So you have to derotate, right? Using towel clips, and then you can fix it, adding a bone graft, right? Usually the pin placement is not a, uh, is, is not a problem in, uh, in these fractures, one of the pins usually should pass towards the middle epicondyle. The other pin can pass towards the metaphysis. That results in good amount of stability. The third scenario is there. The established non-union is there, which is unstable. The child has uh, apprehension. Uh, however, there is no cubitus valgus. Now you can just look at this X-ray, right? You can see this. This is the this is the epiphysis. This is the metaphysis. There is established non-union, right? But still, there is no cubitus valgus. This is the clinical picture of the child. Very good range of motion, full extension, almost full flexion, and there is no cubitus valgus. Now, in such cases, to prevent, because the child is still growing, to prevent occurrence of cubitus valgus, this union osteosynthesis should be attempted. Now, the third scenario is that there is established non-union, right? But there is cubitus valgus also. Now, once the cubitus valgus has developed, there are further two, two things, right? One is that it is with anana palsy. The other scenario is without anana palsy. When the child comes to us with a anana palsy, you have to do something for him, right? So in literature, there are two things which have been described. One is corrective osteotomy with anterior transposition of the anana. The other is, it is not only corrective osteotomy is done, it is also combined with osteosynthesis along with anterior transposition of the anana. Now, when two methods were uh, compared to each other, it was found out that the group that received osteosynthesis along with corrective osteotomy had better results because their apprehension had, uh, had disappeared completely. The, uh, the patients in, where, uh, in whom uh, corrective osteotomy alone was done, they had some amount of it. Uh, instability present. Now to give you an example, this is a small child who had fracture of uh, lateral condyle, cubitus valgus is there, right? Now this uh, adomostotomy has been done to correct this, right? This is pre-op x-ray, this is post-op x-ray, and this is after removal of the, uh, of the implant, right? This is cubitus valgus and this is, uh, this is after correction, this is at the time of implant removal, right? So in a small child, we can 
uh, where the Alnanav deficit is still not there, we can just get away without doing any anterior transposition of the Alnanav by correction of the uh, of the deformity only, right? So the fourth scenario is that established non-union with cubitus valgus, there is no Alnanav palsy, right? So in such cases, we can either wait and watch, right, in a small child uh, where uh, uh, where the amana palsy has not developed, but it can develop. So we have to keep this child in regular follow-up. However, when the cubitus valgus is considerable and the child is is uh, is old enough, we can do a prophylactic surgery, uh, usually a corrective osteotomy, plus minus an anterior transposition because amana palsy is still not there. So a corrective osteotomy usually will suffice in these cases. If we do not do uh, surgical uh, surgical correction usually these are the uh, these are the sequelae which we have to see right a cubitus valgus a non-union a fish tail deformity as I already told you so the take home message is that if you are uh, treating these patients conservatively a close radiographic monitoring is preferable preferably every week for at least four weeks so that you can see that there is if there is any uh, uh, displacement or not if there is sign of displacement, they should be uh, fixed uh, right there, there and then. If it is a displaced, unstable uh, fracture, then obviously we have to operate. If it is a neglected fracture that is less than 12 weeks of, uh, of, uh, of presentation goes to synthesis. And if it is established non-union, then we have to do a swatting or an osteosynthesis with or without anterior transposition. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.